Hello, NodeConf. I'm Hugh. I'm here to talk about Node and musical performance. How's it going? Everyone enjoying everything? Woo! Uh, so just before I start, I wanted to say, how awesome is that music that's going on? It's been really good. <laughs> Thanks, Ben and Sam. So, who are Hugh? Um, I am a BSc Music Computing graduate from Goldsmiths. That's an actual degree. It's very cool. Um, <laughs> I was co-organizing uh, London Music Hack Day in 2014, and I'll be doing that again in 2015. Um, so keep an eye out for that. I uh, develop a lot of web audio API-related tools, and generally kind of I'm an audio developer. Um, my focus is on DSP and uh, music information retrieval, as well as interconnected um, performance systems. Uh, so generally, I'm kind of a music hacker, right? So the current state of, of uh, live music technology is that there's a bunch of proprietary systems, a few open ones, but generally the proprietary ones are, are kind of he hegemonic. Uh, they get used by everyone all the time. Uh, there are certain open standards like MIDI and OSC that let people talk to each other on stage, let devices talk to each other. Um, and interact. <clears throat> so one of these systems is uh, Ableton Live, which is uh, called, it's a bit of software that's called a DAW, Digital Audio Workstation, and uh, <clears throat> it, it can be used for live music and also for music production, but it's, uh, it's like a music tool, really, and you can do things like play, play drums and play instruments with it, connect up big synthesizers, all sorts of uh, really fun things. Um, you can record and loop things back. Uh, there was a video going around on the internet a couple of years ago by a guy called Madion, um, a French uh, musician who you would have seen a little grid thing with green lights. He was just pressing buttons and making this really cool song. That was with Ableton Live. So that's the kind of thing that's, uh, that's happening there. Um, <clears throat> now, the limitations of this is that it's a proprietary app. And yeah, it has certain interconnectivity features for stage, like MIDI. Uh, I know Ben was using it to control some synthesizers using a MIDI patch bay, which was really cool. Um, and it's generally s usable with hardware, but the MIDI protocol is somewhat limiting. The OSC protocols are OK, but doing really custom, interesting stuff with it is quite difficult. Um, <clears throat> so another kind of live music performance and general music uh, language, really, is Max MSP. And calling it a language is uh, somewhat interesting because it is just a load of boxes. So like add, and then a number. So number. so you have three number objects. You connect them in with little cables, almost. And then as you manipulate the numbers, oh, that's, yeah. So it's kind of awkward, because it has this, uh, you really have to, it's a visual language, really. So it executes from left to right. There's this concept of, uh, sorry, from right to left. There's a concept of a, um, an impulse, which they've called, for some reason, a bang. Um, <coughs> so when the left input here receives any change in input, that's what causes uh, output. Whereas the right input doesn't do anything, but then once you change it, uh, it will affect once you start using the left input again. And it's, it's OK. It's very esoteric, and it's very kind of music-focused, multimedia-focused. You have um, a lot of audiovisual work is done in Max MSP. It's, it's pretty good for certain things, but it's not really like a general environment for creative coding involving loads of extra wonderful things. Uh, and interacting with other software developers as well. You can do audio in it, so... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's about the simplest audio thing I could, I could come up with just to demonstrate. So the, the real issue with 
the real issue I have with Max is that it ends up looking like this. Um, yeah, it gets complex. And yeah, there are language, language features. I, I'm never quite sure calling it a language, to be honest. It's so unlike any other languages, computer languages I've ever seen. Um, <coughs> yeah, but it, it ends up looking like this sometimes, which is, you know, it can be tricky. It's not like a nice debuggable little JavaScript uh, file. Um, <coughs> the final one of those to show you is Chuck, which I couldn't figure out how to increase the font size in this because it's a, a custom uh, IDE, I suppose. But there's a virtual machine, and you write code in this custom language called Chuck, and you can add shreds, they call them, and you can uh, you can just manipulate them there on the fly and add them in, remove what specific ones, that sort of fun thing. It's pretty good. Um, <clears throat> but again, it's very music focused, right? It's strongly timed. Uh, you can see this line here. I don't know if you can actually. So this line here, this is telling the virtual machine to run one millisecond of time now. So <coughs> you set up all of your your uh, signal flow with os an oscillator with the frequency, and there's a lot of there's a huge library for that. You can do all sorts of different timbres, all sorts of different synthesis techniques but you actually have to explicitly advance time yourself, which is really interesting and also makes it really difficult to interact with other systems. Um, <coughs> so where does JavaScript fit in, or where does Node fit in? There's a couple of things, that, a couple of features with Node that I think will really uh, facilitate some amazing musical performance in the near future. So first off, there's the Web Audio API, like, what? That's a web API. Well, no, someone implemented it or part of it in Node. Pretty cool. Um, <coughs> there's the, micros the idea of using microservices on stage, which I'll get into again. There's the wonders of NPM, uh, which I'll delve into a little bit in terms of how useful they are in musical performance. And there's also live coding systems that run in Node uh, and in JavaScript generally. Um, the advantage there being with live coding. I don't know if, if live coding is like a thing that... Who, who has heard of live coding in a musical context? Okay, a few. All right. So <clears throat> one of the main issues with live coding that I've seen really is that in uh, systems like Tidal, uh, which is a Haskell-based live coding environment, you can't really call out to other services. And, and use that data elsewhere. Uh, that's partially due to Haskell being um, pure and no side effects or anything. And uh, yeah. Um, <coughs> so the Web Audio API. Um, <coughs> there is an implementation of the Web Audio API for Node. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, it's here. Uh, if anyone wants to go to it when the Wi-Fi works, that's the link. Uh, I'll be publishing my slides, which have all of the links, probably on GitHub, and I'll tweet about that, and it'll be good. Um, <coughs> so Node Web Audio API is being implemented for Node by a guy called Sebastian Picamel and a couple of other contributors. Um, <coughs> it's a very cool API, but it's still in the spec phase. It's not uh, finalized yet. Um, <coughs> which means that we can't really progress totally with uh, finishing off the implementation in Node. Um, but it's getting there. So once this, uh, at, at the current status, you can already uh, grab code that you might have used in the, web, in, the, in the browser for the Web Audio API and use it in Node contexts. Um, which is really, really useful for a variety of, of reasons. But uh, one example I can give is um, in last year, I, I worked on a project with two other undergraduates at my university called Meta, which uh, runs real-time audio feature extraction in the Web Audio API. And what that means is that as you pipe audio through your graph, um, <coughs> your Web Audio graph, you can hook into a specific node on the graph 
grab the audio output stream and run uh, spectral statistics calculations and time domain statistics calculations to figure out certain characteristics of your sound, which is really cool. So here's a little, little demo. <coughs> so using my microphone, say I want to grab a feature called energy, the complex spectrum, because that's always fun. Uh, the RMS, which is like the volume uh, spectral centroid, which is the brightness. Uh, ZCR, which is the number of times that the waveform crosses zero, which is really useful for certain uh, visualizations and machine learning. Um, <coughs> and you can see it all working here, grabbing it in the browser. I was trying to get it to, um, to work in Node last night, but I had an issue with uh, with 4.0 and the microphone library. Uh, I couldn't get it to compile. I tried switching back down the versions. It wasn't happening. So here's it working in the browser. I have tested it in Node, and it works. Um, here's what I was trying to do with it. I can never figure out why that dictionary pop-up comes up. I don't know what I'm pressing. <laughs> so you can have <coughs> little servers running this, uh, this library and just outputting the data uh, on an API, which is uh, really useful because of the applications of the data. You can feed it into um, to like machine learning modules, which I'll get into in a little bit, just very briefly. Um, and then you can expose it on, in your stage Wi-Fi network or your stage network uh, for other devices to go and grab that data and run visualizations off it, which is, I think is what was happening earlier. I'm not, to yeah, OK. <laughs> and, um, and you can run it through synthesizers, so you can parameterize your synthesizers based on uh, the audio features, which is a technique called uh, feature-based synthesis, and then have your audio features from one audio source controlling the synthesis in some other synthesizer that you might be playing notes into on a keyboard or might be playing notes based on some other generative system. Um, <coughs> it can get really cool really quickly, which kind of brings me on to using microservices on stage. So <coughs> um, the micros we're all kind of relatively f uh, familiar with the idea of deploying microservices on cloud systems like AWS or uh, Bluemix, I guess. Um, in, in Docker or whatever, and each performing a tiny little piece of, of whatever you need to do in the overall system. So that's a really, really useful and interesting concept on stage. You can have things like audio feature extraction APIs. You can have um, <coughs> APIs for, for machine learning. So you could have trained a model, for instance, and have that model feeding an API to just go and query to, to pipe into whatever you want. The, the possibilities are limitless, really. Um, the modularity of it is really cool. So you can, even if you're in like a rock band and you're there playing guitar and the drummer and the bassist and everyone, and you have a programmer just kind of to the back where the keyboardist would usually be, just piping all of these microservices together and like controlling the visuals and controlling like the synthesizers, timbre and everything. Um, could be a really compelling, <coughs> compelling thing. And another advantage of it is, um, so as I mentioned earlier, they, the current kind of status of, of uh, live music technology is that m a lot of it is proprietary. There are a few uh, free solutions like, uh, I think, so Chuck is MIT licensed, I think, and the live coding languages are generally free uh, in that sense, and pure data is also licensed. But um, <coughs> with things like Max MSP and n all, as far as I know, the major uh, digital audio workstations, apart from there's one called Ardor, which works on Linux and is MIT licensed, I think, they are all um, pretty platform limited, is, is uh, my main problem with it. Like, if I didn't have to use things like um, like uh, Ableton Live, uh, Propellerhead Reason, Max MSP, I would be using Linux. 
but because my university course requires that I use those things, I have to have a Mac now. Um, so Node really brings out the possibility of uh, building um, <coughs> freer systems for musicians, which is really good because when you consider that most of the software basically requires a Mac, you can use Windows computers, but you can't use Linux computers, really. Uh, there are a few software packages that you can, could use, but most of the main ones you can't. Um, <coughs> when you use Node, you can run it on whatever hardware you like. You're not tied into Mac, which seems uh, less and less focused on um, on the kind of professional side and more and more focused on like integrating with iOS, uh, professional as in mu music, music focused stuff. Um, <coughs> the, other, then the next reason I think Node is fantastic for music hackers is because uh, of NPM. You can just go and search through NPM and find amazing libraries that you can build into microservices to have on your stage to power APIs, to power your synthesizers or your automated accompaniment. Um, if you're like a flautist or something, you can have feature extraction running on the audio out from the flute, powering a um, <coughs> like a, a AI bassist and an AI drummer to, to play like uh, experimental jazz music with you, which is really cool. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I was uh, I was browsing npm and I found a package called Brain.js, which was I was like, oh, oh wow, <laughs> it did uh, neural networks. So I started experimenting with that and uh, doing the kind of feature-based audio synthesis stuff that I was talking about earlier. And you can find all sorts of amazing packages. Like one thing that could be really cool is using uh, the NodeBot packages and Johnny Five and all of those to have like a, a robot to play the snare drum. Like, that would be really cool. Um, <coughs> and finally, live coding in Node. I'm running out of time, so I have to kind of hurry up a bit. There are live coding frameworks in Node. So the, the main sort of general any language live coding frameworks, I would say, are probably Chuck, Super Collider, and Tidal, the Haskell one. Um, and they're all pretty good, but they kind of mostly lack this, uh, this ability to, to interconnect with other, other systems. I know Chuck and probably Super Collider as well have uh, kind of, um, they have the ability to connect in using protocols like OSC, but you don't have that huge community of, of uh, wonderful packages and uh, people who would be interested in contributing to your, uh, your stage programs if, uh, if you go the whole open source route, which would be really good. Uh, there are two live coding, there are more live coding frameworks in Node, but the two ones that I've kind of looked into are Lissajuice, which was written by Kyle Stetz, uh, a web audio API developer in uh, Philadelphia, and Gibber, <coughs> which is kind of similar, really. Uh, and then down at the bottom, several lines down from that, is Watt.js, which is a project that I started for my uh, uh, bachelor's thesis to um, <coughs> to kind of look into the possibility of this sort of uh, microservice on stage thing. And it's pre-alpha, so I'm not going to really talk about it that much. Um, I started doing that in Haskell. So yeah, I had to pivot to Node pretty quick. <laughs> Um, so I'll give a little demo about, about live coding. That could be pretty cool. So I'll do it in the browser again, just because it's set up and ready to go. So <coughs> here's Lissa Juice. Uh, you create tracks, tracks of various methods, so sample, drums. I, drums is a, an array of samples that I created earlier in my setup method. You can then uh, sequence them. So sequence, so uh, zero, zero, 001 uh, dot beat from and then it's going. And you can add, you can like have other tracks, so new track. Bass and then change. 
change the timbre of it. Uh, it's some pretty cool stuff. Um, so I'm I'm out of time, but just really quickly, uh, here's one I made earlier. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. 